Hello folks, it's Mr Neil here. In this video we'll get a look at the analysis, design, testing and evaluation topics within the Higher Computer Science Software Development Unit. When we're designing software we may follow an iterative model and this is where we start by analysing the problem, designing a solution to that problem, implementing our solution, testing our solution and then evaluating our solution. Within analysis we will identify the purpose, scope, boundaries and functional requirements of a problem in terms of inputs, processes and outputs. The purpose of our program is a description in general term of what the program is for. For example, Microsoft Word is a word processing application and Microsoft PowerPoint is a presentation application. The scope is a list of deliverables that a project will hand over to the client. For hire, the deliverables might be the design for your project, its refinements, a test plan, the actual work in program, the results of any testing and a program evaluation. The boundaries are any limits and any constraints which specify what will and most importantly what will not be included within the software. For example if we think about Microsoft Word it doesn't need to worry about video insertion whereas Microsoft PowerPoint does. Within the boundaries we'll also include any assumptions that we as the developers have made. At higher our assumptions will mainly link to the accuracy of information for example, assuming the data being supplied within an external CSV or text file is accurate and correctly formatted, or within our program rounding currency to two decimal places. The functional requirement lists what the software should be able to do. Identifying functionality is important as it will dictate the features to be implemented within the project. At higher, we need to be able to identify the inputs, processes and outputs of a program. The content of the processes is likely to help you be able to work out the sub-programs within a program. Here's an example analysis from BBC Bitesize. The purpose of a program is that it is developed to create usernames for a class of 20 pupils. The program will ask the teacher to enter the first name, surname and age of each pupil. The age entered must be between 5 and 18 and the program should output a list of usernames for the teacher. So the scope of our project is that we will deliver the design, a completed program, a test plan, the results of that testing and evaluation report. And the time limit for the program is going to be between one and two hours. The functional requirements are that the user will input the surname, first name and age. The program will then validate the age and create usernames before outputting the list of usernames to the user. Within the boundaries and assumptions, the class must have 20 pupils, the pupils must be aged between 5 and 18, and all usernames must be unique. Moving on to design. Within design, we need to be able to identify the data types and structures required, read and understand design solutions to problems using structure diagrams and pseudocode, exemplify and implement efficient design solutions to a problem using recognised design techniques showing top level design data flow and refinements, and describe, exemplify and implement user interface design using wireframes. There are a range of different design techniques that we can use when designing our program. We can use pseudocode, which is a text-based design notation with any sub-programs then further refined. Structure diagrams are a highly visual way of representing the top level components and their subsequent refinements, making the structure and hierarchy of a program components very clear. Let's have a look at an example project from the Computing Science Department at Robert Gordon College. Scott Fit Clubs wants to monitor the health of club members by recording their heights and weights and then calculating each member's body mass index. The formula for BMI is weight divided by height squared. The BMI will be either categorised as underweight, ideal weight or overweight. The details of club members are held in a text file which stores the height and the weight. The program will then calculate and display a summary of each height, weight and BMI, then the number of people in each category should be displayed. So if we look at this design using pseudocode, with pseudocode we start by specifying the top level design. This is the main steps. In order to satisfy the functional requirements of this program, we're required to get the data from a file, calculate the BMI, create a BMI summary, display each record and display a summary. 
these top level elements will form the main subprograms within our program. And each of these subprograms will either receive data from the rest of the program or send data to the rest of the program. And this is where our data flow comes in. In are any values that our specified subprogram requires from elsewhere. And out is any data that our subprogram sends to the main program. So in this case, get data from file returns a weight array and a height array to the main program. In order for the calculate BMI to work, it requires the weight and height array and returns a BMI array. The display each record subprogram requires the weight, height and BMI arrays, but does not return any values to the main program. Once we have got our top level design, we can think about refining each of these main steps and specifying how exactly we would do them. For example, here we have the refinements for step one, get data from file. And here we have the refinements for step three, create BMI summary. We could also implement a design for this solution using a structure diagram. You can see we have got our main project, create the BMIs, and then we have got our sub programs within it. Get the data from file, calculate the BMI, create a BMI summary, and then display the details. And similarly to our pseudocode, we've also got a data flow, showing the values that come out and go into each subprogram. If we take the first step, get data from file, we can further refine that within our structure diagram using the appropriate shapes and symbols. And here we have the refinements for step three, create the BMI summary. In addition to designing how the software is going to work, either using a structure diagram or pseudocode, we must also take into consideration the user interface and how the user is going to interact with our program. You can see from both examples of user interfaces on screen, we're specifying the file that the program will work with. We're displaying all the BMIs and then our summary data. Moving on now to look at testing. Within testing, we need to be able to describe, exemplify and implement a comprehensive final test plan to show that functional requirements are met. We need to be able to identify syntax, execution and logic errors, and we need to describe and exemplify debugging techniques, including dry runs, trace tables and tools, breakpoints, and watch points. Software companies can spend a lot of time and money developing their software. It is therefore critical that software is extensively tested before it is released. Testing can be described as comprehensive if it includes sets of test data which covers normal, extreme and exceptional cases. Normal test data is data within an expected range. This represents normal working conditions and is a good indication of reliability. For example, if our program was asking for a number that represented a percentage, normal test data would be 13, 44.6 and 82. Extreme data is data at the limit of what is acceptable. These values still represent valid entries, but can confirm that the software accepts them and produce the expected output. Again, if we're working with percentages, a valid extreme piece of data would be zero and 100. Exceptional test data is data that is out of range. This is to check that the software rejects the data and does not crash. For example, if we were dealing with percentages, minus 42 and 136 exceptional pieces of test data. This type of test data provides useful evidence about the robustness of the software. No matter how careful you are when you write your program code, your programs are likely to have errors or bugs. Debugging is the process of locating and fixing errors in programs. Syntax errors are mistakes in the grammatical syntax of the code. In other words, you have broken the rules of the programming language. Syntax errors are usually highlighted during translation from source code to machine code. Common examples of syntax errors include missing punctuation, misspellings of commands or function names, the incorrect use of brackets or indentation, 
execution errors are only detected during a program run. They cause an abnormal execution or termination of the program. For example, dividing by zero, trying to access an array entry that doesn't exist, or a function not having the correct number of parameters passed into it. The hardest type of errors to detect are logic errors. Logic errors result in the program and function incorrectly, such as producing a result for a complex calculation, which is not correct. These errors are usually the result of poor design and often require rigorous testing to detect. So let's move on to have a look at debugging techniques, starting with dry runs and trace tables. Dry run testing is usually a paper and pencil exercise where the developer manually steps through an algorithm using sample data to record the value of a variable in a trace table as the algorithm unfolds. Let's have a go at doing a dry run using a trace table. Here we have a counter currents algorithm and we are going to ascertain whether this counter currents algorithm works or not. You can see from a trace table that we are told on line three, find value equates to 12. We then move on to the next line and update our trace table. So on line four, we set element to zero. We then proceed to line five, where counter is also set to zero. Moving on to line six, on line six, we're looking for list element. Element is equal to zero, therefore we're looking for list zero, which is 12. On line six, we're looking for list element, which is 12, to be equal to find val, which is also 12. Therefore, we go on to line seven. On line seven, we set counter to the previous counter plus one. The previous counter is zero, plus one, we now have one. As we are in a loop, we now repeat up back to line four, where we increment element by one. We then proceed on to line five, where we set counter to zero. And from here we can see that there is an error within the design of the code as I'm resetting the counter to zero within the loop. So by manually running through the code, I've identified where the error is within my trace table. Another method of identifying errors within code are breakpoints. Breakpoints can be placed where a programmer suspects there is a bug. Breakpoints will then stop the execution at that specified line, and at that point, the contents of the variables can be examined. Within this example here, we have a breakpoint on line six. This means our program will stop prior to running line six. The breakpoint identifies the value of all variables at this point, age, counter, and name. Watch points are similar to breakpoints, but they're assigned to variables. They then stop the execution of a program when a variable changes or when the contents of a specific variable or expression meets a particular condition. This can be at any point in the execution of the code. For example, this could be useful if a file import is failing at record 1,200 out of 2,000. You could stop the program when the counter variable is equal to 1,199 so that you can examine the variable contents at that point. Once we've tested our solution, we move on to evaluation. Within evaluation, we need to describe, identify, and exemplify the valuation of a solution in terms of its fitness for purpose, efficient use of code constructs, usability, maintainability, and robustness. Fitness for purpose is a statement of whether the software functions as specified in the software specification created during the analysis stage. So in order to determine if a program is fit for purpose, a developer must review the analysis. Robust software can cope with abnormal or unexpected conditions without crashing or freezing. It can handle user errors like entering an invalid input, such as the wrong type or inputs out with an acceptable range. Any comments that a developer makes about their robustness should be evidenced by making reference to the testing that has been carried out, particularly in exceptional test cases. Usability is a measure of how easy a user interface is to use and learn. A good user interface should be intuitive. It should also be satisfying to use and effective at accomplishing any particular task. 
When referring to efficiency within an evaluation, we're looking at whether the most appropriate programming constructs or data types have been used. Have we made use of the correct kind of loop? For example, if we're using a fixed loop, is that the most efficient option? What if we're looking through every student in Scotland to find a particular candidate number? Once we've found that candidate, we can stop. Are we making use of functions and procedures and modularity? Modularity should allow us to reuse a function. For example, if we're looking for the computing students with the lowest exam and the lowest coursework, we can use the same function, just provide it with different inputs. Lastly, when we're evaluating software, we're thinking about its maintainability. Software is maintainable if changes can be easily made and quickly. When we're thinking about maintainability, we consider two things. Readability. This is about the code within our program. Is it easy for programmers to understand? Readability is improved by good use of meaningful variable names, white space, indentation of code, and internal commentary. We also want to make sure our program is modular. Programs making effective use of subroutines, subprograms, and parameters are more maintainable because the separate components are easier to identify in the first instance, and they can be changed independently with minimal effect on the rest of the program. So in this video, I have looked at the analysis, design, testing, and evaluation stages of the software development cycle. If you'd like any more information about any aspect of software design and development, why don't you head to the BBC Bite Size website, Scholar from Heriot Watt, or Robert Gordon College's Higher Computing Science revision site.